everybody. Okay, yes, I am back with more girl power history. And I am Megan, if you didn't know that. Alrighty, buddy, let's get into this. On Girl Power History, we talk about interesting women throughout history and all of that good jazz, all that good stuff. So today, the particular woman that we are talking about today is, she was an American competition swimmer. She was an Olympic champion, and she was the first woman to swim across the English Channel. She was known as the Queen of the Waves. So this is Gertrude Ederly, and yeah, let's uh, get into her story. Okay, okay. Before I begin, let me introduce my setup, explain my setup like I always do. I got my female authors behind this fake, very fake plant over here. And I have another fake plant over here. And I'm a pink wallpaper. And my desk and my notes. And of course, my boys, Henry Cavill and Jason Momoa. They represent the masculine energy of this space. I had to try something different, okay? I had to try something different. Yes, it's a very feminine space. Surrounded by feminine energy, we talk only about women here. So that's what our boys are here for, to, you know, represent, I guess, the men out there? I don't know. Either way, let's get into Gertrude's. Gertrude, I can't even pronounce her name. Gertrude, into her story. Gertrude Ederly, she was born October 23 in 1905 in Manhattan, New York City. She was the third of six children and her parents were German immigrants. Gertrude's love of swimming started when her father taught her how to swim in Highlands, New Jersey, where the family owned a summer cottage. I don't know why I said it like that. I don't know. <laughs> yes, and so she actually trained at the Women's Swimming Association, WSA, when she joined, when she was only 12 years old. So our girl Gertrude loved to swim. Obviously, that's the whole point of today's video. So let's actually, like, you know, kind of get into more of how she became the first woman to swim the English Channel, which, if you couldn't tell, is a very tough swim to do because the waters of the English Channel are very cold, they're very rocky. It's just, it's not an easy swim to accomplish. So it's very impressive if you didn't know. So let's get into how she became a badass, well-known swimmer. So the sport of competitive swimming before this time in the 1800s was generally accepted to only be a man's sport, but in the early 1900s, it started branching out into being inclusive of women becoming competitive swimmers. And the reason why more women became competitive swimmers was the bathing suit, which clearly I'm not in a bathing suit. It's flipping cold at my house today. <laughs> That's why I'm in a turtleneck. But this swimming suit that was developed in the early 1900s and you know, early 1920s was a swimsuit that made it more possible and easier for women to swim in the water. Because the OG female swimming suit was pretty much a burlap sack. So, as the construction of a better swimsuit became available to women, more women became competitive swimmers. And actually, a woman named Charlotte Epi Epstein, who was the director of the WSA, she actually urged the Amateur Athletic Union to endorse women's swimming as a sport in 1917. And she said, quote, to allow swimmers to remove their stockings for competition as long as they quickly put on a rope once they got out of the watcher. So remember, you know, we didn't have women wearing skimpy little bikinis like we do nowadays. The way women dressed back in the early 1900s was of course much more conservative. So you can believe that a baby suit was very scandalous. Right? Women, as said by that quote, used to have to wear stockings to go swimming, right? And so Charlotte Epstein, she really like encouraged 
and pressured the Amateur Athletic Union to allow women to swim as a sport. And this, and Charlotte was actually the director of our girl, Gertrude, so Gertrude actually learned a lot from Charlotte. Now, I feel like we should uh, actually meet our girl. <laughs> this is Gertrude Ederly. Um Yes, this was the closest outfit that I could find that resembled a bathing suit, but I'm fairly positive it was just a top. Um, I have no clue, but oh well. Now, our girl, Gertrude, before she swam the English Channel, at a very young age, she started racking up all of these awards. So she set her first world record in the 880-yard freestyle, becoming the youngest world record holder in swimming. She ended up setting eight more world records after that. So in total, she held 29 U.S. national and world records from 1921 until 1925. So our girl, Gershu, she loved to swim. We're just gonna, <laughs> I guess this is me making her look like she's swimming. This is very cringy, this is very awkward. Just pretend I didn't do that. In 1924, she joined the Summer Olympics, which took place in Paris. Now, Gershud won a gold medal as a member of the first place US team in the four by 100 meter freestyle relay. So our girl Gershud racking up these wins showing that she's some badass swimmer. Now, let's actually get into the point of the story, how she started to train to swim the English Channel, which comes with its own little sets of drama. Like always, of course, because you know me. I like to deliver on the drama. So in 1925, Gertrude became a professional swimmer because apparently before this she was just an amateur swimmer. But now she's professional. So like, take note of that. So in 1925, to practice for the Swimming in the English Channel, she actually swam the 22 miles from Battery Park to Sandy Hook in seven hours and 11 minutes. Which she held that record for 81 years before it was eventually broken by an Australian swimmer. Now, when it was announced that Gertrude would swim the English Channel, it became this big thing in England, because remember, Gertrude was an American, swimming the English Channel. Now, in England, they had all of our newspapers, they wrote England or a drown, meaning there was, I think England in a way didn't want the first person to swim across the English Channel to be American. <laughs> so there was a lot of like debates and press about whether Gertrude would successfully be able to swim the English Channel. Now only five people had tried to swim the English Channel before her and they're all men. So she was the first woman to ever attempt to even do this. So no one has succeeded in completely successfully swimming the channel at this point. The English Channel, as I said already, you know, it was of course very cold water. They had constantly changing tides, six foot waves, you know, frigid temperatures, and lots and lots of jellyfish apparently. So there were lots of complications and challenges in swimming the English Channel. And I should really say, at this point, count how many times I have said the English Channel, and I will say the English Channel because I think it will be a lot. Now, let's actually get into some drama. So, Gertrude, our girl Gertrude, to, as she trained to swim the English Channel, she worked with a trainer named, I didn't even think to look up how to pronounce his name. It's either Habez Wolf or Jabez Wolf. I apologize, I've always, I did not Google it until this second. It completely slipped my mind. That shows you how much of a sucky YouTuber I am. <laughs> Awkward, awkward, awkward. But either way, she, we're just gonna call him Wolf, okay? So she trained with this guy. But a bing here he is. So now Wolf, he had attempted to swim the English Channel 22 times, okay, but he never succeeded. Now, there was some tension between the two. Their training went like this. Okay, I'm swimming, I'm swimming, I'm swimming. Okay, slow down. Okay, I'm swimming, I'm swimming. No, slow down. No, I'm swimming, I'm slow down. If you're like, Megan, what the heck? Well, apparently Wolf, he actually tried to slow down Gertrude's pace, saying that she would never last at the speed she was going as she tried swimming the English Channel. But Gertrude did not like that. 
She's like, oh, oh my God, this guy, seriously, he's trying to control me. He's trying to prevent me from succeeding at this. This seriously sucks. And Wolf is like, hey, I'm just trying to do my job over here, okay? You're seriously, you're not gonna be able to succeed at this. Well, while she was making her first attempt, first, first attempt at swimming the English Channel, Wolf apparently got her disqualified. Because as Gertrude was swimming, apparently Wolf felt like she was in trouble or danger or something. So he was like, hey, I need to get another swimmer in there and get her out. So he got this other swimmer named Isaac Helmy to go into the water and essentially help Gertrude get out of the water. Now Gertrude was pissed. She's like, no, no, that's not okay. I was doing okay. Oh my God. What happened was apparently a wolf thought that Gertrude was drowning because she was floating face down in the water. But she actually said that she was not drowning, she was just floating face down in the water. <laughs> so unfortunately she got disqualified, which again really pissed her off. And apparently Wolf had actually said that, hmm. No woman is capable of swimming the English Channel. So there were some rumors of sexism going on and rumors that Wolf didn't actually want Gertrude to succeed at swimming in the English Channel. But here was like another rumor. So even though we know that she got disqualified, so I should clarify that as she's swimming in the English Channel, there are boats around her. There's people that are following her, making sure that she, you know, doesn't die, obviously, and you know, are able to report on what's happening. But the people on these boats next to her as she's swimming are not allowed to touch her, but they are obviously allowed to offer her food and water and drink. So they're just not allowed to actually like touch her or help her in any way swim. I.e., by being touched and pulled out of the water by another swimmer. That's why Gershu got disqualified. But apparently there was this like rumor, I guess, that the British press had invented this story as a sense of like a national rivalry, 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 blah, 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 blah. I hate this word, rivalry. The way you have to swim the English Channel is you have to zigzag as you swim it. You can't just swim in a straight line because of the ever constant changing of the tides. It forces you to have to zigzag. And apparently the reality was that Gertrude wasn't prepared for it like she thought she was. So, yes, like I said, drama, rumors, theories, all that stuff, all that crap. But again, Gertrude stuck to it. She claimed that her trainer, Wolf, made her quit and that she would have gone on to swim it. So, there you go. <laughs> but the wonderful thing is, it made her just all the more determined to come back in 1926 and try again. And apparently, fun little fact, her father promised her a red roadster if she made it across the English Channel. So Gertrude was like, I'm not only in it for you know the fame and the fortune, I'm also totally in it to get a red roadster. I see you Gertrude, I see you girl. Now, in the meantime that Gertrude was practicing to attempt to swim in the English Channel again, four other female swimmers arrived to try and swim across the English Channel. Three of them American and one English woman but none of them were able to successfully swim across the whole English Channel. It was just too challenging. So the failures of these four women just encouraged this belief in England that this strong body of water, that if men couldn't accomplish it, then how in the world could a woman accomplish it? So there was just a lot of sexist views that women just would be incapable of swimming across the English Channel. But now, a funny thing is, Gertrude actually called all the men that thought she couldn't swim across the English Channel, quote, channel croakers. That's what you call them, these chauvinistic, sexist men who thought she couldn't do it. She's like, yo, you guys are channel croakers, okay? So like, don't mess with me. Before Gertrude attempted her second run in swimming the English Channel, on the day that she was to swim it again, she showed up in a bathing suit. Now this is some bathing suit scandal I want to talk about quick legs, so let's let me talk about it really quick. She tried again to swim the English Channel at the age of 20. And so when she showed up on the beach the day she was to swim it again, she was wearing 
estrogen and bathing suit. Now, before this time, women's bathing suits were practically wore dresses. Like I said, they were practically burlap sacks, pretty much. And they had stockings and shoes with them as a bathing suit, okay? When they emerged in the 19th century. So bathing suits for women in the 19th century, so 1800s, was a war dress, stockings, and shoes. And now a lot of reformers and suffragettes, they're like, hey yo, these bathing suits are completely heavy and unsafe. And that, like, if a woman were to go in the water with these dresses, uh, yo, they might drown. But the kicker is, majority of women continue to wear these bathing suits because skimpier bathing suits were just taboo. And in some cases, skimpier bathing suits were illegal. In 1907, police at Boston's Revere Beach arrested an Australian swimmer, a woman, named Annette Kellerman, who ran a one-piece suit that showed her bare legs. She was arrested, you guys. And now I'm thinking about all the skimpy bikinis we wear today. Can you just imagine? It's that's, that's crazy to think about. Now, the kicker was when Gertrude swam the English Channel for the first time, she wore a heavy one piece that was expected of her. The kicker was this heavy bathing suit. It ended up getting filled with water and it ended up chafing her skin. So it really slowed her progress down. So when she came back in 1926 to try again, she arrived on the beach wearing a lighter two-piece suit that she fashioned by cutting up a one-piece suit. But yes, our girl was wearing a two-piece, it's kind of tough for me to show, a two-piece bathing suit. So the funny thing is, she slathered herself all up in grease to make swimming through the water easier. The girl was just covered in grease no one could hardly recognize her in her two-piece suit, rocking it, ready to take on the English Channel again. And apparently this swimsuit was also made of silk, so it was barely visible under her layers upon layers of grease. I swear I wouldn't be surprised if some people thought she was like naked or something. Now, her layers of grease, just a funny fact, was she had a base layer of olive oil, then lanolin, and then a heavy yellow-white grease. And on top of that, she had a coat combined of lard and Vaseline. So she had all these layers upon layers of all of these different oils, all of these different greases, again, to make swimming through the water easier. Now our girl Gertrude ended up finally getting into the water. So let's talk about how she successfully swam the English Channel on her second try. Now, in preparation to swim the English Channel a second time, Gertrude trained with a man named Bill Burgess. Bam! <laughs> yes, all my men looking like women, but you know, that's the way we roll here. Now, Bill had actually tried to swim the English Channel himself. Right, so he had experience with these waters and knew how to train our girl Gertrude much better than this guy. <laughs> Now, their relationship was much different. Bill encouraged Gertrude to succeed. He's like, girl, you got this. Okay, you got this. Okay, you got this. Okay. See, I'm just guessing that's how uh, swim coaches train their students. I actually have like, I don't know, clue. <laughs> so the kick is, Gertrude went into the water on the morning of August 6th, 1926. And she came ashore 14 hours and 34 minutes later, successfully going across the entire English Channel. Can you imagine spending 14 and a half hours in water? That's just, I can't even swim. Oh, you guys, I can't even swim. Like, fun fact for myself, I can't even swim. Let's talk about how she managed to do it right this time. Now, I should say that Gertrude held her record until Florence Chadwick swam the channel in 1950 in only 13 hours and 20 minutes. So how Gertrude successfully attempted it a second time was she used a motorcycle goggles to protect her eyes from the salt water. I got some good advice. Okay, use motorcycle goggles. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, the kick it is, what helped Gertrude succeed was the type of swimming motion that she used. I'm not an expert on, now you use your arms. Gertrude used the American crawl, which is a which is a type of swimming stroke 
that is regarded as the fastest of the four primary swimming strokes. Now, on her second attempt, she had an entourage of family and friends on a boat nearby her, which included her father and one of her sisters, Meg, as well as a woman named Julia Hartman, who was a writer for the New York Daily News, which was a paper that sponsored Gershu's swim. Now, Julia would not allow reporters from other newspapers to get on the boat and reporting what Gertrude was doing because Julia wanted to be the first one to report on Gertrude's successful swim across the English Channel. And so because of that, there was a second tugboat that was ordered by the other disgruntled reporters that were pissed at Julia for not allowing them on the original boat. Uh, so now there were two boats that were swimming by following Gertrude on her path. During her swim, one of the boats actually came close to touching her. Fortunately, it did not. Otherwise, that would have completely ruined her chances at succeeding. Now, but this incident of one of the boats coming close to almost touching her caused a lot of bitterness and tension because there were a lot of people accusing the British press of you know, trying to ruin her chances, but there were also people that accused the British press of trying to protect Gershude from the bad elements because remember both boats are on her side so in a way they're kind of protecting her from you know some of the harsher weather that could happen when you're swimming the English Channel. And so some argue that by the two boats following her it made her swim easier. And now I just thought this was funny that her support boat, which was the boat that had her friends and family on, was packed with chicken lips, oranges, and vegetable chicken soup in her journey and apparently her sister Meg played Gertrude's favorite records on a gramophone so our girl Gertrude had some music that she was listening to <laughs> on her swim. <laughs> hey anything to make it easier right but 14 hours so like you know I get it I get it. Now the cool thing was as the boats were following her this was kind of one of the first incidents of a sort of play-by-play -play sports event because the reporters were using a wireless to report back on Gertrude's swimming happenings. So it was a sort of like play-by-play -play sports event. One of the first ever, which I thought was kind of interesting. I'm not a sports person, but if you are, I hope that you enjoy that, okay? <laughs> At one point on her journey, as she's swimming, 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 her trainer, Bill, became really concerned for Gertrude because there were a lot of really bad winds that were starting to pick up during this time. He actually yelled at her, Gertie, you must come out when the really bad winds started picking up. And within an hour, a storm had completely descended on Gertrude swimming in the water. And waves from the water were just pulling against her body. But the funny thing is, after Bill was like, you need to come out, Gertrude, as she was swimming, she lifted her head and was like, what for? Just by the fact that waves were just smacking against her body, she's like, why would I get out? I'm doing my thing. Leave me be. And finally, unfortunately, Gertrude made her way up onto the beach at Kingsdown, England, after 14 hours and 34 minutes, like I said before. And apparently, the first person to greet her was a British immigration officer who actually requested a passport from Gertrude, but there was a whole slew of other people that were waiting for her, excited to see her success. Now apparently at the end of her swim, after she made it to the beach, she was described as looking like a boxer, you know, so like a boxer, because she was so bruised from how hard the water had hit her during her swim. You know, the water like clobbered her face, so her face was just torn up, bruised up, and apparently her tongue had swelled up so much in her mouth that she couldn't even talk for a bit because of all the salt water. And she also had some jellyfish stings. So this poor girl, oh boy, she suffered a lot on her swim, but she succeeded and she became known, of course, the first woman to ever swim the English Channel. Now, after this event, Gershoot, of course, became famous. The kicker is, she had a slight fall from fame, so let's talk about that. When 
after she had returned home, she was greeted to a ticker taper parade in Manhattan. So more than two million people lined up to see Gertrude Ederle. And they were so excited. They're like, oh my God, this girl. Oh my God, this is like so cool. And you know, our girl, she started raking in the money. And even President Calvin Coolidge dubbed her America's best girl. And of course her father did give her that red roaster. Not roaster, red roadster. <laughs> Red Roadster, Red Roadster, Red Roadster, say five that five, oh my god, say that five times fast. I can't even say that five times fast. The American suffragist Carrie Chapman Cat, who we might talk about in a future episode, said, quote, about Gertrude's win, that it was a far cry from swimming the channel to the days to which my memory goes back, when it was thought that a woman could not throw a ball or even walk very far down the street without feeling free. So, remember back in the 1800s, women were seen as these precious porcelain little dolls that, like Carrie Chapman Cat said, that woman couldn't even walk down the street without oh, feeling faint. You know, it's probably from all those really tight corsets they were wearing, but like, you know, there's that. So again, this was astounding success that Gertrude had achieved. And our cool thing is, apparently more than 60,000 women had gained the American Red Cross Swimming Certificate in the 1920s due to Gertrude's success. But for a few months, she was like literally the most famous person in the world. But then uh, things started to go downhill, unfortunately. So she actually wanted to play herself in a movie called Swim Girl Swim, and she toured the vaudeville circuit. She had a song and dance named after her. She was like on the top of her A game. But the problem was her manager was not able to capitalize on her success for much longer. So Gertrude's career in vaudeville went down the drain. And the kicker was the Great Depression, which happened in the late 1920s, early 1930s, diminished her financial rewards. And so her fame was eclipsed in May 1927 when Charles Lindbergh flew an airplane across the Atlantic Ocean for the first time. So compared to this technological feat of an airplane, again, in 1927, of an airplane, which you know people had never seen before, this technological feat of an airplane flying across the Atlantic Ocean for the first time, it just made the Gertrude swim across the English Channel seem old fashioned. It just made it seem like, eh, not a big deal anymore. So unfortunately, people just stopped caring about Gertrude. They stopped caring about what she was doing. And her career went down the drain after that, unfortunately. So quote, Charles Lindbergh became the new hero. And Gertrude was almost like a relic overnight. Now, unfortunately, a tragedy struck her when she fell down her steps in her apartment building in 1933 and twisted her spine which left her bedridden for several years. The nice thing is she did eventually recover. And now the sad part is, as we're talking about the fall from her fame, as she mentioned how she died, she never married, which hey, I respect. <laughs> no judgment, girl be doing her thing. But she never married and she was living in an old people's home in 2001. And she later died on November 30th, 2003 at the age of 98. So she did live for a very, very long time. Her fame back in the 20s and 30s just never recovered. But the wonderful thing is, I want to end on a high note though, that her accomplishments paved the way for other female swimmers. The next four people to successfully swim the English Channel were all women. That's pretty cool. So actually, American columnist Haywood Brown, in an article for the New York World, he wrote, quote, when Gertrude Ederle struck out from France, she left behind her world, which has believed for a great many centuries that woman is the weaker vessel. Much of government, most of law, and practically all of morality is based upon this assumption. And when her toes touched the sands of England, she stepped out of the water into a brand new world. So she stepped into a brand new world that accepted women in sports, accepted women as being badasses, accepted that women could throw a ball and you know could kick a ball and could swim the English Channel. All thanks to this girl, Gertrude Ederle. That's pretty powerful and actually kind of gives me goosebumps. Makes me excited. Makes me feel just 
stay happy. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video on Gertrude Ederly. And don't forget to subscribe. Like always, if you liked this video. And actually, if you subscribe next week, we're going to talk about the woman who invented the Barbie doll. Look forward to that next week. And I hope you guys have a beautiful, wonderful day. So say goodbye to our boys, like always, and my fake plants. Good stuff. And have a beautiful, wonderful day. See you guys. <laughs>